So I'm Oceana from Families for Life Freedom Incorporated. We were founded in 2019. We are the leading voice for families directly affected by the lead poisoning um, crisis here in Syracuse. We are 501c3. And we are the forefront of the movement for inclusion and for our many parent leaders in the decision making and funding priorities around lead poisoning prevention in Onondaga County. Our mission, we are a conduit for parents to speak out. We are a conduit for families and their communities affected by childhood lead poisoning to voice their concerns, questions, and ideas so smarter decisions can make, be made in the fight against childhood lead poisoning. We provide each other with mutual support and love that is needed when entire families are tra traumatized by the tragedy of lead poisoning. We are organizing greater leadership roles for parents in this struggle. We seek to build family-led coalition that will set the priorities for our public health needs, especially ending childhood lead poisoning. So what does uh, Families for Lead Freedom Now Incorporated do? So right now we are helping families find testing and, um, for their children and for their homes. Uh, we help navigate code enforcement. We help families uh, navigate the Onondaga County Health Department. Um, we help with filling out the necessary forms for getting the home remediated, the HUD forms that either a landlord or a homeowner may need to fill out in order to get funding. Um, we help families with getting an IEP or individual education plan or 504 plan for their children who are entering school needing additional support. Um, we have served as a parent advocate for special education meetings when a parent needs someone to go along with them because that can be overwhelming. Um, educating the public and policymakers on the issues of lead, training human service organizations, their staff, and their community members on lead and how to help families navigate the system, and referrals to legal services when necessary, um, just to name a few. Lead has a severe impact on children. It impairs their cell, cell growth in their brain and restricts development. Children can be hate, exhibit uh, hyper irritability and have ADHD. They experience difficulties with learning, focusing, and retention of information. It can affect their heart. It inhibits hemoglobin production, which causes anemia and high blood pressure. It can inhi um, inhibit their growth because it hinders bone development. And they can have severe stomach issues with pain and kidney inflammation. So the last time I spoke to you here at CNY Solidarity, it was just after the People's Public Hearing and we came to you with four demands. So I'll give you an update on where we are with that. So for our demands for the city, one of them was we asked for full enforcement of the city's lead ordinance that was passed back in 2019. The city started to enforce the lead ordinance in August of 2022. Unfortunately, the ordinance is not fully being enforced at this time, giving residents a false sense of security. The city uses the rental registry to generate inspections, and currently the city only has about 50% compliance with the rental registry. Although tenants can call and request an inspection on their own, most tenants are not aware of this. And this is a failure on the city's part to educate residents of the lead ordinance and their rights under it. Currently, when the city does do an inspection, they are only citing for visual peeling paint. So paint that they can come in and either see on the inside or the outside of the house that is actually peeling. They are not doing the dust wipes as the lead ordinance indicates they're supposed to do because landlords do, are refusing to pay the $250 per unit cost for them to be done. The city is currently outsourcing this to a contractor instead of code inspectors doing it themselves as was understood when the ordinance was written. The city also has purchased XRF guns to use during inspection, and they are not currently using them, and no reason was given to me from code enforcement as to why they aren't using them. Um, lastly, the person whom they have placed in charge of the lead paint program coordinator uh, does not clearly understand the ordinance and he will need further training in order for, for this to be up and off the ground and enforced as it should be. Um, the lead ordinance was put in place to give tenants and our residents protections. Unfortunately, the person who is in charge of the lead paint program at code enforcement thinks that the lead ordinance was put in place to train contractors and that 
totally not what we fought for. Um, two, we asked the city to make the rental registry public. Currently, if you go to the city's website and you type in rental registry, it will bring you to a page that says rental registry. It will even give you a search box to say that you can search for data, but the rental registry is not searchable. It is not user friendly. Um, if you type in an address, any address in the city will tell you it's not found. Um, so families should be able to have an easily searchable online database so that they can ensure that their landlords are in compliance with local ordinances, such as the lead ordinance, and they should also be able to see that there are no open code violations on a property prior to them moving in. As for our demands from the county at the time, we asked them to release the race and place data of all children found with lead poisoning. Currently, Onondaga has just begun releasing lead data based on race and by zip code. In 2021, the data of all kids tested in Onondaga County, 437 children came back with elevated blood levels for lead. Of those 437 um, children, 396 of those cases were located directly in the city of Syracuse. Keep in mind, I said, of the kids tested. We are still missing about 50% of the kids who should be tested. So we'd like to share with you some of the, the wins that Families for Lead Freedom uh, just accomplished. After advocating for the past three years and being told that it could not be done, we will see the return of the mobile testing unit for lead. It will not be the lead bus that we all grew up with back in the early 80s when they literally drove block by block down some of the um, hardest hit areas by lead and did testing. Unfortunately, they are telling us now that um, the lead bus will be available for events. They don't know how many, but we will have to pre-register all the children who need to be tested. Um, the problem with that is that if we have a child who shows up at an event and is in need of testing and doesn't get tested, that is a missed opportunity um, for the county to get that child tested. Onondaga County will also be launching an early intervention program for children affected by lead. This is the first program that is giving early interventions to children with them only needed to, needing to be affected by lead in order to um, be admitted to the program. The problem is that they are only admitting 100 children in the first year. We know that we are poisoning much more children than that, so um, we want to work on expanding that program. And then finally, the Lead Safe CNY Coalition has relaunched bringing affected families to the table for the first time to work on solutions to solve the problem. So to the question of how CNY Solidarity Coalition can support the fight for lead freedom and justice. Support for state and legislative budget proposals, Lead Free Kids New York has built a statewide coalition. They are managed by Children's Defense Fund New York. The coalition includes Clean and Healthy New York, We Act Environmental Justice, and, Lead, and Families for Lead Freedom Incorporated, just to name a few. Um, there's many, many more around the state, too many for me to name or list here. And these are their current proposals um, for this legislative season. For their budgets ask, they're asking for $50 million to support the existing and additional counties within the Childhood Lead Poisoning Primary and Secondary Prevention Programs. They're asking that the governor strengthen and expand Part T of the HMH to ensure effective implementation and include policy priorities. They are also asking to increase funding for New York State's Children's Environmental Health Centers from $4 million up to $5 million. They are asking to provide $10 million to the Division of Housing and Community Renewal as grants to landlords to conduct lead abatement these funds need to be tied to protections for renters, so they need to make sure that renters are covered um, when landlords are able to use these funds. Um, we are asking um, for bills that they're trying to pass, the lead testing at point of sale bill, so when a home is sold, there will, um, if this bill passes, there will need to be lead testing done on the home prior to closing. Um, I have included the bills, it's uh, S2353, um, in the Senate, and it's A482020 in the Assembly. 
and I will um, forward these slides to Chris um, to share with everybody so that you'll be able to um, refer to them when contacting your legislators. They're also asking for the landlord insurance coverage bill. Right now, um, insurance companies are not covering landlords for um, injuries called by, caused by lead poisoning. So this means that when a child is injured from lead poisoning in a, in a home that a landlord owns, the family really has no recourse to sue the landlord. Most of the time, the homes aren't really worth much. Um, the landlords will transfer them to an LLC, but the family is left with lifelong um, bills to cover and medical issues for the child. Another one is the Lead Pipes Right to Know Act. Um, the reason that they are asking for this bill is so that New York State will have to map all of the lead pipes in the entire state. There is a lot of money um, in the President's Build Back Better Act geared specifically toward these lead service lines. And if they can map them out, this will make it easier to target the federal government um, for those funds. So what can we do on the local level? We want you to call your common counselors, the mayor's office, and code enforcement and, and insist that they fully implement the lead ordinance that was passed. We want them to insist that code enforcement officers are fully trained and understand the lead ordinance in its entirety, especially the person responsible for enforcing it. We would like you to call on the Common Council and the Mayor's Office to ensure that rental registry is searchable and user-friendly for all city residents. We'd like you to call on the City of Syracuse to launch a public campaign to educate residents on the ordinance and what their rights are under it. For the county, we'd like you to ask them to expand the early intervention program and provide funding for its expansion. To make the mobile testing unit available for at least 10 public events. Um, we encourage you to enjoy, join the committees of the Lead Safe CNY Coalition and support Families for Lead Freedom Now Incorporated in our mission to end childhood lead poisoning. Thank you, and I'll stop sharing and take any questions that you may have. Well, <laughs> what does the city ordinance say? regarding what is the, the main provisions of the city ordinance on lead? So the city should be inspecting those res, um, rental units every three years. They should be doing dust wipes as part of that inspection um, because we cannot see uh, the dust that sometimes comes in through the windows in the um, contact services such as doors, friction surfaces and that's not currently being done. They should be using the XRF gun to test the walls. They should also be advising uh, residents of their rights um, that landlords cannot evict them because their child became poisoned in the home, that they cannot use tactics that they have used in the past where suddenly they raise a resident's rent by $300, which is basically pricing them out of the home and forcing an eviction um, to make sure that they are following up to um, get the work done. If a family needs to be relocated, the landlord should be paying for that relocation during the time that the work needs to be done. And they should be making referrals to the district attorney's office for landlords who are constantly not doing the work, um, refusing to do the work, and putting families in danger. And that's just like the brief uh, Cliff Notes version of um, what they're supposed to be doing. So just a quick follow-up. Has any of this law ever been enforced in the city? No, we, they just started enforcement, or what they said was enforcement. And after um, a recent interview that I did with WAER, in which their lead paint coordinator was on that panel, um, which that will air uh, this week on the 30th on WAER for Syracuse Speaks, um, it was disclosed that the city is only doing visual inspections. So they're not doing full inspections of the rental units. So if they come out and do an inspection and tell that family that that unit is safe, they are really giving them a false sense of security because they have not done their due diligence. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I'd like to hear from other folks. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, this is it's kind of overwhelming to hear how much the city is not doing. I know the the ordinance passed, but it sounds like they're uh, doing a terrible job of enforcing it. And um, I mean, is to make that happen. Is this a matter of phone calls to city hall or city councilors or everything? I mean, specifically, what should I, if, if I want to pick up the phone and call city hall, mm -hmm. um, what should I tell them? It just sounds like there's so much. Um, yeah, well, one, they need to get their, their lead paint um, program coordinator trained um unfortunately i am not the only person who has talked to him and don't get me wrong i think he has a very big heart and wants to help solve the problem but he is very undereducated on what the problem is and he's very undereducated on the um lead ordinance so who is he who is he what's his name his name is keenan lewis um it's right up on the um website for the city of syracuse he is under the direct supervision of Michael Collins, who is in charge of uh, wow. neighborhood and business development, and Jake Deshaw, who is the head of code enforcement. Um, but he is not currently, they're not currently enforcing that lead ordinance in its um, entirety. And he really needs to be brought up to speed or they need to get somebody qualified to do the job. So. Um, and I know that um, there were some people this week that did make a call to City Hall, um, were referred to code enforcement, and were treated very rudely um, by Jake Deshaw in code enforcement. Um, so our next steps are to call directly on to the mayor's office to ask that they get it up to speed, because it's not fair to residents, it's not fair to tenants. What, what's mm -hmm. the... Who's really in charge in terms of, you said Michael Collins or Jake Deshaw. Is Jake Deshaw in charge of? Uh, is Jake Deshaw is um, Keenan Lewis's direct supervisor. He is the head of code enforcement. Uh, and Michael Collins is over both of them because he is in charge of neighborhood and business development. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Darlene has a hand up, I believe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hope you guys can hear me. I'm out and about with my yes. children currently. Um, I didn't know was I didn't know that this was going on, so I didn't make uh, you know proper time to be able to be somewhere quietly. So I apologize for the background noise. Um, but I, I just want to touch base a little bit with this whole situation with the lead ordinance and all that. They're they're playing what they're doing is they're playing games with residents, right? Perfect example. They came to my house last year. My children were affected in 2019 by one landlord. That landlord was able to sell the house illegally in the middle of the pandemic. My house came back five times higher, the lead level, than the first time as of May of last year. I'm still in that same exact house. Twins are still being affected by the lead. When I contact code enforcement and pertaining to Mr. Lewis specifically, they play this game of, oh, we've reached out to X, Y, and Z. It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of BS what's going on down there. So what I have done is I started working with a coalition called Citizens Action that is actually putting actions into place and kind of putting the neck on um, the elected officials. We have gone to Albany, Lord knows how many times this year, um, and Albany is kind of starting to listen just a little bit. Um, I know they are currently waiting for the last couple of signatures on a new bill they're trying to pass called the Childhood Lead Prevention and Safe Housing Act for Syracuse and upstate New York that we are currently working on. Um, we are going back to Albany again on the 29th and the 30th to constantly keep putting pressure on them because we know that the budget is about to wrap up soon. So we're trying to make sure that the Syracuse, New York and upstate New York bills are being passed because unfortunately upstate really doesn't have um, a voice when it comes to these issues, even though they have just shown in the paper um, just recently that again, Flint, Flint basically Flint was able to, the parents from Flint was able to sue the city of Flint and establish funding for those families that were being hit by the lead. We're, we're kind of like really far behind, so to speak. So what the hopes of, of with all of that is to be able to implicate a law where 
like how Oceana was saying something about like the LLCs or whatnot, or whatever the case right. is, a lot of landlords are starting to catch on to that. So they are perfect example. My address, my, uh, my, the LLC that my landlord has is my address. So it's not even a real LLC. It's, my, it's literally my address LLC. You understand? So it's like they're, they're trying to do a lot of slick things to try and get out of certain, certain things or whatever the case is. Um, Oceana just verified and said that the health department is supposed to be sending out um, paperwork to the district attorney. I walked to the district attorney's office myself one day after I left the health department. The district attorney's office has never heard of no such thing. When I showed them the paperwork, they had no clue. They didn't even know who to direct me to. No, nothing. So none of that is happening. None of that is happening. But what they're doing is they're putting a bunch of blame on the tenant and the residents and causing a lot more stress and a lot more harm. Because if you think about it again, like I said, we're still in the same house, so, which means what? We're still breathing in the lead. I'm literally fixing, fixing my house myself. Like I just paid for my sinks and stuff to get fixed, all types of stuff I'm paying for, which I shouldn't have to be paying for as the tenant. So I'm currently in the process of trying to actually take my landlord to court with hopes of being able to take over the property to teach him how to be a landlord. So that's short notice, um, but maybe you guys can let people in your coalition know if they don't already know. I'm pretty sure they do, though, about um, the bus trip where we're trying to get as many Syracusans and upstate people as we possibly can to actually go to Albany and really let them know, like, listen, we have a voice. We're here, and we and our children, we deserve this. So that, that, that's where that, that's at currently. Right. Right. And as Darlene said, that, that story about code enforcement giving her the runaround, it's the same. These are the same calls I'm taking from other parents around Syracuse. Um, one landlord was allowed to send uh, pictures that he had fixed the problem. Um, when the tenant called to say, hey, he hasn't been back out, code enforcement said, well, we closed your case. Your landlord sent in a picture saying he fixed the problem. When she finally had code enforcement come out and show her the picture and they went and looked, it was not even a picture of her home. So uh -huh. code enforcement, right, code enforcement should not be closing cases without coming back out to inspect that the actual work was done. So I don't know where to start here. Um, about the registry, the rental registry, that's obviously not just about lead, that's about code. That's about violations in general. Right. They should, you should be able to see if it has lead violations. You should be able to see any code enforced violations. Is the city um, given a reason why it's not been activated? Um, Michael Kahn's kept telling me it was impossible to do. And if you hear the city of Syracuse tell it, we put the rental registry online. Um, literally right before this meeting, I went and searched the rental registry again to see if it was up and running. And it is not. Um, it's there, and it has a searchable bar that says you can search addresses, but every address you put in, it comes back as not found. Um, so it's a totally useless tool. Mm. Um, we have asked the city of Syracuse to model after the program that Rochester is starting. Um, I'm not sure if they have completely uh, had on online yet, but what they are doing is giving... I don't know. I know there's people downstairs. Downstairs? They're Mary, giving, please mute. Okay, I can't. They're giving landlords a grade system. Um, so Rochester residents will be able to search that registry of any um, house in the city. They will be able to see how responsive those landlords are to code enforcement problems. If their lead inspection has been done, they'll give them a letter grade A, B, C, D, E, or F. They are also... Um, <laughs> making sure that they're cross-referencing these LLCs. So if they see an LLC has several LLCs that gets mailed to the same address or is using the phone number, they are putting those properties together and saying, you are one landlord and we're going to grade you together on all of these properties. Um, so you, they will be able to see exactly if I want to be renting from this landlord or not. Um, but every time we talk to the city about this, we get told it's a software problem. Um, they can't get the software developers to get it fixed. This has been going on literally since we started back in 2018, 2019. So why they still haven't gotten it fixed or why they're still dealing with this um, software developer is beyond me. Have you tried meeting with the mayor? I have met with the mayor. Um, I have another call out to the mayor again after my interactions with Keenan Lewis. So hopefully I will be meeting with them again. 
the buck stops there. Yeah. Yeah. And the county. Yeah. The county, they're not. Off yeah. Because the they are, um, they're not much better. They're just a little better, but they're not much better. Um, they're still missing children that should have been tested, that they're not um, getting out and getting in and getting tested. They have the names and addresses. Um, I've been working with Peace Incorporated who has handed them a list of kids to say these kids still need lead testing um, and they haven't been tested yet. They're also responsible for making sure that pediatricians are doing those tests at one and two. And we still know we have a large group of pediatricians who are not following through on those tests and that falls under the county health department. Would you like some of us to go with you if you, I mean, not that you can't handle it, but if you want more support, can you let us know when you're going to meet with the mayor and maybe some of us might be able to join you? Yeah, we can let Chris Flynn know. She joins our um, EJ coalition meeting every Friday at noon. Um, so we can make her aware of all of those um, meetings when they come up. And I see Brent's hand is up. It's been up for a little bit. Do we know our presentation? Uh, the origin of our problem is it more water or more paint? In Syracuse, it is more of the lead paint and the lead dust. 91% um, of the housing stock within the city was built prior to 1978. Right. That's harder to fix. Right. <laughs> Brand, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, my question. Yeah, my question, Oceana, was, um, and thank you for your comprehensive uh, report. It 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 uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to digest, but it certainly seems like uh, this is continues to be an issue. I'm wondering, in terms of children, if that one that being the school because it's the children are already older when the time they're in the school system because you mentioned the problem of getting the the testing mobile uh, around often enough and things like that i mean the school set up i think to do some health check of the kids and but maybe that's too complicated i meant the city at least the city schools right and and the other uh thought i had was Hmm. You know, impact on on real estate to fund this. If the, it sounds like funding may be an issue, if they together, I mean, um, we contribute tax money for other, uh, public health issues. You know, sewer, water, etc. It's the public health rest as adequately as it needs to be and i'm wondering if even me making such a proposal would make people take this a little more seriously okay thanks very much okay i think think i got most of the question i'll try to start with the first one so um as far as testing goes um children should receive their first initial test at one and two although we should continue to test children right up to six. They're supposed to be screened at their pediatrician's office at every well child check up until they are six. Um, in the state of Colorado, they do test children right up until six. Um, for my granddaughter personally, she was not lead poisoned until she was four years old because she was playing outside in our yard um, and our zip, uh, drip line was contaminated with lead, which is where she um, was poisoned at. Um, has kids transitioned to school, the reason that we want to say that um, finding the children are only the first step in what we do. So when we find them at one and two, we've identified them, but we need to get those early interventions because sometimes a lot of the symptoms don't show up until they become school age. So when they're kindergarten, first grade, second grade, suddenly they can't sit still in their seat. They can't concentrate on their work. Um, they are having difficulties with learning but no one is making the connection back to the fact that the child was lead poisoned at one and two. And our group is um, working to make sure that that happens, that we are keeping track of these children, that the school district is aware when they come in, that they get their interventions as soon as they enter the school system. Let's start right at kindergarten, make sure they have their evaluations, let's make sure they have what they need. Um, but that is not currently happening. 
as far as funding goes, um, the city of Syracuse and Onondaga County have money. They just need to put it where it's needed. Um, I know we've all heard me complain about the giant fish tank that is getting approved or has gotten approved. Um, that's money that could be spent on much more um, human and health services, whether it's, whether it's lead or whether it's making sure children get fed. Um, our kids are living in the highest rate of poverty. We know um, from the maps, which I didn't put up today, I believe I brought to you guys last time, if we put down the redlining map, the lead map, the gunshots fired map, the map that shows where children are failing their third grade reading assessments and the mm -hmm. map of childhood poverty, they all align right on top of one another in the city of Syracuse. So these things are all interconnected. And I say to policymakers all the time, it's going to take a multi-pronged approach for us to overcome lead. Um, and you need to be listening to families because we're the ones living with this. We know how it's affecting our children. We know how it's affecting our lives. Um, so we are the ones that are best in place to help other families solve this issue and get through it. Um, yeah, I have a question about uh, IEPs, right? Individual education plans, yeah. um, ADHD diagnosis. Right. Does it, is there a requirement that a child be actually formally diagnosed for ADHD before they get an IEP? Yes, so unfortunately, just lead poisoning alone, even though we know it's a neurotoxin and it yeah. is a brain injury. So when children are poisoned with lead, they are actually actually have a non-traumatic brain injury, meaning that they got a brain injury without actually whacking their head on something. Um, but that is not enough in and of itself to get an IEP. So when a child is lead poisoned and needs an IEP, you have to look for those code diagnoses. And I've gone to a few... Um, special education meetings with parents because initially those parents went in and they were just snowballed over by the school system and told, you know, that you're basically your child is misbehaving. And I will tell those parents, ask for the meeting again, tell them you're bringing a parent advocate. Don't tell them who the advocate is because they don't need to know I'm coming until I get there. <laughs> um, then we will go back in with everything from your doctors. And then all of a sudden the school says, oh, I didn't understand what mom was saying. You did understand what mom was saying, but you chose not to listen to her, and that's not okay. But that's what our parents are facing when they go into schools trying to get the interventions to make sure that their children can get the same education as everybody else. Okay. Darlene? Yeah, so the whole, the only thing with the school thing is that, that, that I would definitely agree with the teachers on because I'm, I'm literally witnessing it myself. My kids just had got their evaluations done a couple of months ago, right? We had to go back because one of my children is stuttering even more, we're learning. So we had to kind of um, edit his IEP or whatever the case is. So when the school is saying, you know, if they're giving us IEPs and things like that, but then these kids are going right back into these same houses and breathing in this lead dust and more effects are coming out from the lead further down the line, it's kind of like we kind of keep got to keep going back to the drawing board. You understand? So that's why it's so important where we fix the housing issue first, because if the housing is not safe, the housing is not safe. So if a kid, you, you've done all this IEP stuff, kid, you got them all this services, great. Boom. Now must go down the line. You start to see another change in this child. Now you have to go right back to the drawing board for a whole another IEP. And for some parents, it's frustrating. Not a lot of parents can afford to take time off of work, be able to do all of that stuff, to run back and forth to the school. Like the, before I had, um, we did the IEPs, the teacher was calling me every day, literally in the middle of my shift, two, three times a day, this woman was calling me. And it's like, it was only so much I can do because again, they're going right back into the same lead affected house. So like, Kind of like my hands are tied, you know what I'm saying? So we really got to get this, the housing situation underway, like as soon as possible. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing circle. Um, and the other problem is in our country, we don't treat housing like the consumer product it is. Rental housing is a consumer product just like buying a car. But it's not um, regulated the same as any other consumer product. If I sold you a car with bad brakes, the state would come and shut my dealership down. If you go to Walmart and you buy a crock pot that you bring home and explodes on your counter, um, 
that crock pot will be recalled. You can sue Walmart for selling it. You can sue the crock pot maker for making it. You have some repercussions. Childhood lead poisoning is the only time when someone can poison your child and nobody goes to jail. Nobody is held accountable for hurting your child. And often the parents are blamed. Oshana, oh, is part of the problem, you talked about the rental registry, and I think your slide said only 50% of rental properties right. are on the registry. If I remember correctly, it's supposed to be required, but there's just no backing that up. So half of our, half of our rental properties don't have a registry, which means they don't have to be inspected. Is right. that right? Right. If they're not on the registry, they're not getting inspected. Um, the reason that we are up to 50%, we were at 30% prior to the county making COVID payments um, for back rent when um, COVID went on. And the county did require those landlords in order to get those checks for that back rent for COVID. They did have to go get on the um, city's rental registry. So that boosted us up to 50%. But my thing with the county is you're making payments a lot of times every month, Section 8 also, you're making payments every one month for some of these rental properties. You should be making sure that they're on the rental registry um, prior to making those payments for the, to those landlords. Um, the same with organizations that resettle refugees. Um, I would say to them, before you resettle a refugee family into that home, you should make sure that that house is compliant with local ordinances, such as the rental registry. That should be required. Um, we're bringing these families over, we're reselling them into homes with lead, and they have no idea. And they don't speak the language, which brings up even a, more of a challenge once their child is poisoned. It goes hand in hand. I'm looking at selling my house, and I learned recently that it's basically buyer beware. I can sell my house in pretty much any condition, and unless they hire an inspector or whatever, I'm not really held liable. Right. So it, that, that all goes hand in hand. I could not believe it, yeah. in New York State especially. Yeah, and even with um, the home inspections, um, when you're buying a house and having a home inspection, most often they may not even check for lead. Unless they actually see visual peeling paint, they mm -hmm. may say to you, by the way, that could be lead. Um, that's why it's so important that we get that um, point of sale bill passed. Um, what landlords are doing, um, has in Darlene's case where she said her one landlord sold the house to a new landlord, and now that landlord comes in and claims ignorance. Well, I didn't know the house had lead in it because he wasn't required. So we are forcing them at point of sale. Uh, landlords can no longer claim ignorance that they didn't know it was there. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that home inspectors are not allowed to do anything physical to a house of any kind. Right. They can't even take a chip off of a window sill. I mean, that is part of their legal structure. Is that they can't scrape anything. They can only right. look. Right. So, so unless he actually sees the peeling paint. Yeah, they can't, they can can't do anything that may be, right. right. He can say that may be lead. That would be your only indicator. Um, and pretty much if you're buying a house within the city limits, you're almost guaranteed to buy a house that has lead in it because we have so many homes built prior to 1978. In, in terms of the state legislator, Darlene talked about some of this. She may be gone. Um, we know Rachel May is supportive of at least some of what we need. Um, we have some of our people, our constituents of John Mannion, and in the assembly, we have Magnarelli, we have Hunter, and we have Sturpey. Do you know where those other people stand on, on these issues? So Rachel May, John Mannion, and Pamela Hunter have all signed on to our bill. Um, <laughs> I have not heard, um, at least from our coalition yet, on Al Sturpey or um, Magnarelli. Um, our other issue is what um, I spent some time doing about a month ago on Advocacy Day is talking to a lot of downstate um, legislators whose votes we need to get this stuff passed, um, one of whom didn't even realize how much lead was in his own backyard. He thought like, oh, 
well, we don't have that problem there. I said, well, we can pull it up right now and, and look for you. And, and sure enough, they are riddled with lead. And for them, it's lead pipes. I'm like, so some of these bills are very important to your district. Okay. Do we have any more questions? I guess, so it's just a, to try to sum it all up. Uh, De um, De Deborah Rose has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Deborah. Go ahead. Just a quick quick question. Oceana, you mentioned um, a radio show you're, you did on WAER that's being aired on the 30th. What what time is the, what do you know when that show is on? And um, I know it's going to be Syracuse Speaks. And um, when I talked to them Friday, they were still editing. So they have not given me the time when that is going to air yet. But the name of the show is called Syracuse Speaks, and it's going to air on WAER. Okay, thank you. Yeah, on that panel was myself, um, Travis Hobart, who is the head of, uh, Dr. Travis Hobart, who is the head of our uh, upstate lead clinic here in um, Syracuse, one of five lead, um, such clinics around the state. Um, Jessica Bensagera from the city of Syracuse and Kenan Lewis from the city of Syracuse. And I'm still not quite sure why Onondaga County did not have anybody on that panel. I don't know if they weren't invited or if they refused to come, so I can't they had to why they weren't there. Okay. Peter, maybe we could add that to the newsletter so that, okay, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, if, if you can give me a, if by Tuesday you have a time, um, I can send it out in the newsletter. Okay. Publicize that some more. Yeah. Yep. So, so I have a quick, so it's kind of to sum up, to sum up, there's, mm -hmm. there's action at the state level and mm -hmm. then there's action at the local level. Uh, Jane has a question. Oh, Jane, I'm sorry. It's okay. Oceana, you mentioned a $50 million figure um, earlier that's going to be allocated. Um, how far, this, this sounds like an enormous problem, and $50 million sounds like a lot of money. How far will that really go to solve the problems that you're talking about? Um, it, it won't, to be honest. We are in the, the billions to solve this problem. Um, but we are trying to stress to our legislators that by getting ahead of it, taking care of the homes instead of using children to find the homes, we will actually be saving money. Um, my 43-year-old brother who was lead poisoned still relies, so he's outlived both of my parents, um, which means now is that he relies on my siblings. Um, if he outlives both of us, I'm not sure what his fate would be, um, but he needs services in his home five days a week to do things that we take for granted, like prepare meals that he can put in the microwave, remind him to shower, um, take him out grocery shopping, um, get him out in the community to try to do as many normal things as possible. So he's been dealing with this since he was two years old. My mother had a perfectly normal child, and then at two years old, his entire fate was decided by um, some lead dust that was in our home. And back then, you could have much, much higher levels than what is allowed now. So what we're saying is we would save money on the back end by making sure we take care of it up front. It will save in medical costs. It would save in criminal justice costs. We know that children who are lead poisoned, as they become teenagers, they start to get into trouble. It leads straight to the school to prison pipeline. I would bet my entire house that if we were to go test all of the children in Hillbrook right now or look up their childhood lead levels, almost all of them will have had um, childhood lead poisoning. We tend to see girls um, in their teens, higher rates of teenage pregnancy with childhood lead poisoning. Then as they get older, if they don't end up in prison, if they don't end up in Oakwood because of their actions and becoming violent, um, as they grow older, we see issues with heart conditions, kidney conditions, um, early onset dementia, because lead is a brain injury. Um, a lot of you have heard of the NFL players suffering from CTE. And upon autopsy, when they look at a player's brain who has had CTE, there's a type of bruising on the brain called tau. We see those same bruisings in children who have been lead poisoning. They, lead poisoning. They have that same towel on their brains if we were to do an autopsy. So 
we want to prevent the problem. This is really about saving children's brains, giving them quality of life. Okay, I'm sorry. Any more questions? Uh, Marianne, is that a is that a yes or I want to speak? <laughs> <laughs> and Ron, Ron has his hand up. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if um, if a landlord wants to participate in the Section Eight program, mm -hmm. um, what is the requirement of? In, in terms of uh, lead paint or lead pipes? So their home is supposed to be um, lead free. And I know Darlene is off the call, but um, her landlord is actually accepting Section 8 for her. And so there is an issue with these agencies enforcing their own rules. So some of them are paying landlords who shouldn't be paid. We should be withholding that rent or we should be making every effort then to move that family out of the home if the landlord does not want to become compliant. Mm -hmm. Chris? Um, yeah, uh, Oceana, um, since Section 8, it, I think it's administered by the Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. Does the Housing Authority get involved in making sure that the landlords that accept Section 8 abide by federal law? and state law and local law. <laughs> well, what I would say is they're supposed to. Um, what I have seen is that that is not always happening. Um, unless they have a tenant who is really saying, like, you shouldn't be paying this landlord. I'm still dealing with this situation. That is when I am seeing rents withheld by Section 8 and some enforcement getting done. Um, but it's like a 50-50 with whether they enforce it or whether they don't. And Section 8 does their own inspection, so I don't know how they're missing this. Um, they do an inspection mm -hmm. before the tenant moves in, and then they do so many inspections, however often they need to do them while the tenant is living there. So there's no reason for them to not be catching this. They can also get the information from the city and the county as to whether there's a child in that home who's been lead poisoned or whether there's open violations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? Okay, so I guess that what I was trying to get at is um, what specific actions would you like from us with regard to City Hall? So for City Hall, um, at this point, I think we are going to be having to put pressure on the mayor. Um, I have been putting pressure myself on code enforcement since before they started actually enforcing the lead ordinance. And I just keep getting one excuse after another. Um, I don't see any difference. It's been a year now or over a year since this individual has been in this position. Um, and I'm very concerned about either the advice he is giving or his understanding of the lead ordinance. Um, I went to an event that code enforcement was holding over on Baker Ave where they have you walk through a home and they point out what code violations are. And he was actually giving medical advice to a parent. So I had to intervene because that could get the city sued. We should not be giving medical advice. He should not be giving medical advice. Um, but I really more so need him to understand what his job is in doing and enforcing that uh, lead ordinance what you're supposed to come out and do, the things you should be citing for, making sure that the tenant understands what their rights are if the landlord isn't complying um, doing what he's supposed to do, and the fact that they're not even doing full inspections. Um, you're allowing the landlord to opt out because they don't want to pay the 250 but from our understanding was that code enforcement was going to be doing those dust wipes all along, and it's not happening. Um, and then in terms of supporting the bills, if we can't go to Albany with you, what's the next best thing? Um, so I won't be on the bus to Albany myself. I have actually been um, on the phone and communicating with legislators. So write your legislator, um, include those bills in it. If you have the numbers, um, call them, tell them you would like them to sign on and to pass these bills. Okay, what we can do for the uh, Tuesday's newsletter, Peter, is take that information that's on the slide 
uh, presentation, we could make that into an action, those yeah, phone calls. So we're going to have the slides. So I'll look at that up. I'll put those bill numbers in. Yeah. And uh, I'll forward them to you, Chris. Okay. Thank you, Luciana. You said um, that May and Mannion. May and Mannion and Hunter have signed on. Hunter are good. So Sturpey and Magnarelli in particular, people should ask for support for those bills that are in this, that are mentioned on the slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do that. We can, I think, try to get, I think if, if you make an appointment with the mayor, we could get a couple people to go with you. Just let them know it's not, it's not just Oceana again. Um, might we, we could, and we can go to the Commons Council. Yep. We'll be there. Yep. So I'm, I'll be following up on the call I made last week, um, this week, since I haven't heard back. Um, because the concerns are, are serious. Um, they really do need someone who understands that lead ordinance to be enforcing it. And it is a false sense of security to tell residents that we're passing your house, but in all actuality, their house may not be clear. I'd also like to mention that um, Farming Social Services also pays a lot um, of, of the rents for these places. Right. And they need to, something needs to be, they need to be worked with so that they withhold um, the payments. So, so they hold, they sometimes withhold the payments that as soon as one issue is resolved, they start paying again. Right. In some cases, it's not one issue. It's a multitude of issues. So it really has to be looked at more systemically. Yeah, they only hold the rents now if the county calls over and, and says, like, this landlord really isn't responsive. But that's not um, always happening. Um, and in the interim, we've got a new um, commissioner of health, and she is not up to speed on all of the lead laws and mm -hmm. enforcement of them. Um, we did have a meeting with her last week, and when we asked why the health department was not um, using their enforcement mechanisms where they can hold hearings, they can find landlords, they can make referrals to the district attorney, um, we gave her the public health laws for which they fall under um, 132425. 26, I believe, um, she wasn't even aware of them, mm -hmm. and she is in charge of county health. So I understand they stopped the hearings during COVID. I don't understand why they couldn't hold a hearing over Zoom, but they stopped them all together. We are living in an endemic now instead of a pandemic, so we're accepting that COVID's going to be around. They should be mm -hmm. back holding those hearings. Um, you know, one thing that, that we can do, we we try to limit our emails to the whole discussion list to the regular newsletter plus an occasional meeting announcements. But we also have a discussion list, uh, mailing list, that, that consists of pretty much everybody here and another 60 or so people who have come to meetings and we can send more emails to that so if there if uh if you come up with other specific requests for you know call your common counselor and ask for this we, you know we can send an email every week to the discussion list with specific asks for people to do you know over the, over the next month or two okay. so that, yep, and that and we, um... may have some effect yeah, we will be, um, since we have accomplished some of our asks of, of mostly of the county, or very few of the city, we're going to be um, going back over those asks and, and redeveloping our list so I can get that to you, Peter. Okay, great. Wow. Oh. Okay, any more, any other comments uh, for last minute? Yeah, Stephanie. This is stunning. <laughs> That's all I can say about it, I'm sorry. I really appreciate your depth of discussion about the issues. I am very interested in the systemic organization of the people that are supposed to deal with these things. I tried to write as many notes as possible, but if I have any questions, I'll come back. Or if there's something about the structure of 
who's in charge of what and contact related to this and that. I mean, you've got your the city, the county, the health department. The I mean, there's so many different things that yeah. should state of New York. Yeah, it's, it's a multi pronged issue. Um, wow. If you have any, if anybody has any further questions and they want to get them to Chris Flynn, I'm sure she'll get them to me and, and um, we'll make sure they get answered. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can do that. We can do that. Uh -huh. Ron, you had your hand up and you took it down. You still have something? Or, well, just just a question about the if you could give us the uh, the law or regulation that allows a landlord to just flat out refuse to pay the two hundred and fifty dollars, and that that ends the uh, the the any remedy. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's so much as a law. I think code enforcement is allowing them to do it right now. Mm -hmm. Oh. The city yeah. <laughs> tells the city says landlords are supposed to sign up for the rental registry, mm -hmm. but then they never follow up. They yeah. don't make them do it. Right. Which right. means they can go forever without inspection. And and as, as Oceana has said a couple times, sometimes the inspections aren't even real. Right. Yes, I have gotten um calls from what I consider good landlords who have uh, said, hey, I was supposed to have my rental registry inspection today. And the inspector called and told me I didn't have to be there, that he was just going to drive by and pass me. And so they've, ne yeah, they've never entered the house. So again, giving families a false sense of security that the home has been inspected. Is it possible that there is actually a staffing issue in the city that they literally don't have the staff to do it, to do everything that needs to get done? I just wonder about that. Um, are, are the code people um, over work or the burden? If you think so about all I was the told that, that would have to be yeah. inspected and they just don't have the staff to do it. I was told that they restructured um, codes. Um, so before they just were sending inspectors out in all different directions and some inspectors um, they all have their specialty. Some are um, more um, equipped to go inspect commercial buildings, but they had had them inspecting houses and vice versa. Some who are um, able to inspect houses but don't have the knowledge to inspect commercial buildings. So they had reassigned them. They also um, assigned them to zones. Um, so that way you have the same inspector covering the same area. He becomes familiar with the landlords in the home. So I was told that that's all been done. I was told that they have all had their lead training, um, but now I'm starting to question that. I think the city should have a department instead of that is just in charge of lead. That is their job. They need a commissioner of that department who oversees the people who are inspecting lead, who oversees the people who are filling out the HUD grants and make sure that the um, letter in this is being enforced and that they are educating the public on it. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I think we need need to move towards because this is, is bigger than they're giving it credit for. Uh -huh. And it's a very long standing set of practices. It, it's built into the culture of that department. Yep. 40 years ago when I was a contractor, I was dealing with inspectors who did drive-by inspections, and yeah. it's always been that way. And yeah, yeah I was with Oceana when they were, they were telling, yes, we've restructured it. It's going to work now. Those problems are fixed. Well, they're not. You don't fix problems that are built into the culture of, of a workplace right. by saying we fixed it. They haven't fixed it. Right. As I said, allowing a landlord to take a picture and send that in has proof that he has fixed an issue without an inspector coming back out to fully check that he has fixed it and closing the case, that should not be allowed. And then when the inspector got out there with the tenant, they both went and looked, it wasn't even a picture of her house. So who knows where he took the picture at? Um, they should be coming back out and re-inspecting to make sure that it was done and done properly. Um, just like the, I'm sure the story that you all read in the paper today about the child with the carbon monoxide and that I'm sure that house is not on the rental registry. I'm sure it was not getting inspections done. And now this is what it led to. There's no protections for, um, tenants who are renting. 
Oceana, what are the chances of getting the mayor to call in Collins and Disha for the meeting with you and some friends? I'm sure he will. He made them come the last time. Um, I, I went with all of the leaders um, from our organization. Um, so he did call in uh, uh, Jake Deshaw and Mike Collins and Sharon Owens and a few more people from neighborhood and business development. Um, and I'm sure he'll call them in again. Um, I expect that this time, though, the meeting may be a little more confrontational because uh, Mr. Deshaw does not like us to challenge his employees. But this is a matter of safety at this point. I'll just make one comment um, as a, I'm an educator. I taught at Nottingham High School for 33 years. And the fundamental issues of the school system are the security of the housing of the kids that are there that bounce around all year long and cause issues because of the, 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 they're not having what they need. So I don't understand why the government, <laughs> I'm an idealistic person still, I don't know how. Um, <laughs> I just. I just don't understand why, you know, th this this is a problem that would fix, you, you have to fix the whole housing thing. I, I, I this has been going on for years. And mm -hmm. if you the housing that'll and, and get people the services they need, that'll go a long way to fixing the schools. And that'll go a long way to fixing Syracuse period. So right. yeah, F 50 years this year, to be exact, Onondaga County declared um, war on lead paint in 1972. So 50 years wow. exactly this year is how long we have been fighting the lead paint issue here in Syracuse. Okay. Wow. Landlords must have a lot of power as seen by that mailer that they just sent out. Did you see that one against the eviction, the eviction um, legislation? Yeah, they, they do. The reason that our um, lead ordinance is not as strong as the lead ordinance in Rochester um, one, the lead ordinance that we passed was the very first ordinance that Rochester passed. Since then, Rochester has revised their ordinance several times. They have beaten the legal challenges that landlords have brought against them. But Syracuse didn't take that ordinance and try to put that one in place because there are a group of landlords, an organization of landlords up on the university that lobby the Common Council regularly and contribute to their campaigns who said, if you pass a stronger ordinance, we will sue. And so that is why we have the ordinance that we have and not the stronger one that Rochester has already legally tested for us. Mm -hmm. And the landlords lost, right? In Rochester, Rochester they right. lost. Here they won. Oh, yeah. This, yeah, is here, the, here they won. this would be a question to Dick as well. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is the high cost of remediation. And I don't think there has been much progress in making bigger, a better and cheaper remediation methods. So the government could uh, spend some money on sponsoring research to figure out cheaper and better remediation methods, especially for the paint job. Yeah. Right. The yeah, well, we do have literally millions of dollars available here in Syracuse to pay for the remediation. Um, wow. Landlords and tenants can apply together um, to get the home remediated if, if, if the tenant is living there. And for homeowners, you can apply directly yourself. So there are funds out there to help lower the cost on landlords to get it remediated. The problem is you need landlords and tenants to work together. Mm. Well, thank you for all you're doing, Oshina. Yes, thank you so um, much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, so eye-opening, and uh, so it's been only fifty years. Yeah, only fifty years. That, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a half a century, and we're still doing this. Um, yeah, yeah. But if nobody else has a question, we will let Oceana go, and uh, please let us know how we can um, have this group can uh, assist you. Um, Peter, uh, we will put something in Tuesday's newsletter and um, just keep us, uh, you know, uh, updated. I, I very much appreciate your coming on. You're welcome and thank you for having me back. You're welcome.